five seconds to submergence. Submergence deep into the absurd. A friend once asked me, Greg, why do you think there is universal beauty? Now, my friend, uh, he's pretty religious, so I knew that this was probably, <laughs> I knew this was probably a segue into like some sort of like advertisement for his belief system. But anyways, I, I replied to him, I suppose that's the way it is, or something like that. And he said, it's almost like there's a God who wanted us to enjoy it. So I told him that it wasn't outside the realm of possibility, which it wasn't. However, later on, I realized that this question as to whether or as to why there is universal beauty, it's flawed. Uh, my, my friend and I, we were both in that situation under the assumption that there was such a thing as universal beauty, that everyone in the entire world throughout human history all thought the same things were beautiful. This notion could not be any further from the truth. Sure, almost anyone thinks a sunset is beautiful, that mountains, lakes, valley, valleys, etc. are beautiful, or blossoming flowers and trees are beautiful, but None of these things are beautiful to a blind man who cannot see any of them. Similarly, uh, these things may not even be beautiful to people who can see them. Um, and this can even be dependent on the mood of any given day. I mean, I have, I've been out on a beautiful day, like in the sun, you know, I've been at like wonderful, awesome, beautiful beaches looking out at the ocean and I was just in terrible moods in some of these times and I couldn't appreciate how beautiful the ocean was on these days because I was just super hot. So I just didn't find it beautiful, right? Um, so, I mean, seeing something as beautiful can be dependent on your mood. <laughs> something as as a as ever changing as the mood and i mean an ugly child will be the most precious and beautiful thing to its parents a song i think is beautiful may be like ear piercing to you and a beautiful lightning storm may just send a Vietnam veteran into a state of frantic PTSD. Beauty is not, by any means, universal. But what is beauty? To me, beauty is, for the most part, a, a feeling. It is a feeling of awe, wonder, and reverence. And it's, it's brought on by the input of specific sensory information in one's surroundings. Even some of my thoughts, I think, are beautiful. Um, I'll even hear someone tell me something, and I'll think it's beautiful, something that they thought of. Uh, in, in some lights, I could see a shovel on the side of a shed as beautiful in some days. Um, because these things, they kind of inflict this really magical feeling of wonder into us or awe or greatness. And we see certain things or hear certain things, smell some things, and our mind just explodes. Um, and anyways, going back to uh, universalizing this feeling, this feeling of beauty, reverence, awe, to everything, to everyone, saying that everything is beauty, beautiful to everyone, um, or that, that everyone finds the same things as beautiful. Um, this, 
this isn't a good mindset, at least in, in my opinion. Um, we have seen that the universalization of feelings and certain other transitory mental phenomena can lead to drastic disregard of individuals. I've been reading Carl Jung's The Undiscovered Self lately, and as he puts it, the bigger the crowd, the more negligible the individual becomes. For instance, we have seen that the standardization of intelligence tests can often make extremely intelligent individuals appear to be extremely ignorant. If you were, say, to measure my intelligence regarding school subjects like math and English, history, science, and whatnot during high school and compare these scores with my dad's scores, then I would appear to be genius compared to him. But if we were to be both tasked with digging a perfect ditch to place a pool in a backyard, I would not even know where to begin. My dad is a genius when it comes to landscaping, and this genius actually allows his family to live. Yet somehow the school system values my ability to find the derivative of 2x to the 8th minus 4 far more valuable than his ability to allow people to build anything on any land. Um, our intelligence is not a universal thing. You know, people have different kinds of intelligences. People are smart in different areas. We know different things. Um, my, uh, a friend of mine once told me, he was telling me that, uh, that like, oh, like, I don't understand how people think animals are so smart, they're so stupid compared to humans. And then I'm just thinking, okay, well, there are birds in the American Southeast that can accurately predict a hurricane up to four months before it happens. They'll, I don't remember the kind of bird, but it's, it's a species of bird and that spends its, uh, its winters in southeastern America. And they will migrate to the south, either earlier or later, depending on when a hurricane will happen, right? Um, no humans can predict hurricanes that well, that accurately. They are so in tune with their environment, they're so intelligent as to how the world works that they can predict hurricanes and we can't. Um, no human being can navigate with just sound. I mean, sure, maybe some blind people do a pretty good job with that, but not nearly as good as a bat can. Not nearly as good as a bat can. Uh, bats can navigate with just sound, with just sonar um, in the dark. They have terrible vision, and yet they are pinpoint accuracy with their sound. Uh, the, the thing is, people, it's, it's not that human beings are more intelligent than animals. It is more so that animals merely hold a different kind of intelligence than humans do. It's different. It's just not the same kind of things. We hold different contents within our brains. Um, if you were to send me out in the wilderness to try and survive, <laughs> I'd probably be dead faster than a ladybug, right? <laughs> and ladybugs, I mean, they they don't look particularly smart, right? But yet they can probably survive longer than me in the wilderness of the Amazon rainforest, right? So, anyways, things can't really be universalized, right? Individuals are different. Um, in Young's same essay, uh, and the same section actually, he gives an analogy to the measuring of the average weight of a pebble in a bed of pebbles. If, say, the average weight of a pebble is five ounces, we would likely not find a single pebble that weighed this exact amount in this bed of pebbles. That is, the individual, though possibly quite similar to others in the herd, is still entirely unique from everyone else. This uniqueness contributes to their determination as to whether or not something is beautiful.
right? Um, me being a unique person, uh, I might find certain songs beautiful while um, other people might find these same songs ugly. You know, I'll find certain things ugly and other people will find them beautiful, right? Um, some things just don't click with us, right? Uh, we're, we're all different and we all find different things beautiful and different things ugly. Um, so, with that said, I will say that uh, the Nietzsche theorized that beauty, more specifically art and aesthetics, involves a certain level of indulgence for the beauty seer, or here, or censor. That is, we consume and indulge beauty as if it is a drug, food, or beverage. Aesthetics and all those things deemed as beautiful to the individual give that individual a feeling of pleasure. This can come in the form of a feeling of reverence, of nostalgia, of awe, of wonder, of gratitude, or even serenity, calmness, peace. Though, as, as mentioned, no two people are the exact same. That said, two people may see or hear the same thing and not both think it is beautiful. Or uh, they may see or hear the same thing and both think it's beautiful, but not have the same feel feelings manifested out of this beauty. Um, I might see something that might make me feel calm, but I do think it's beautiful. And another person might just be filled with awe. But we both think it's beautiful, right? But in a different way. So we not only see different things as beautiful, but we also feel different kinds of beauty from these same things. Now, many things that we see as beautiful is also dependent on context, time, our emotions, our memories, and of course, our, our conditioning. Growing up listening to classic rock, I enjoy listening to 60s, 70s, and 80s music. But over time, I lost interest in some of the bands I liked as a kid, like, like ACDC or Blue Oyster Cult or uh, Led Zeppelin. I mean, sure, some of them still sound good, but they didn't sound like as like awesome as they did the first few times that I heard them, right? They kind of just sound like, eh, they're okay, right? Um, and say, like, something like the snow season... Um, it was way more beautiful uh, before I learned how to drive in it, right? Um, now it's kind of associated, with, well, at least like it's beautiful when I'm not driving, but when I'm driving, like the snow doesn't necessarily feel as beautiful as when I'm like not on the road worrying about sliding into someone, right? Um, it, it's, it's a question of the context, like where you are, um, how your thoughts and feelings change over time. Um, what we see is beautiful. It, it changes over time, and it's, it's, it's dependent on certain environmental factors like culture, our parents' likes and dislikes, and the memories and experiences we gain over time, right? Um, and so that, uh, that brings us back to, or at least that moves us towards the artist. And the artist, as the creator of beauty and aesthetics, must be willing to be both misunderstood and disliked by a large number of people because everyone sees different things as beautiful, right? So, uh, so if you're an artist and you're trying to please everyone, I mean, good luck. <laughs> good luck, man. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not going to work, right? Um, Nietzsche has proclaimed that although being misunderstood and disliked by a large number of people is a terrible fate. It is necessary in the creation of good art, of true beauty. It is in fact not only necessary, but absolutely unavoidable. If you were to try to please everyone with your art, you simply could not be an artist. Um, you just couldn't. That just wouldn't be possible. Right? Not everyone's going to like your stuff. Not You, you know, you play the guitar, not everyone's going to 
like it. I mean, they might like like it, but they might not find it beautiful. They might not find it awesome, right? You know, I've heard people play guitar and I'll think, you know, that's like you're really doing a good job, but I don't particularly like what they're playing, right? I don't find it beautiful. Um, or like, you know, I'll hear someone play piano. I'll be like, yeah, they're awesome pianists, but I don't like that kind of music, right? So, uh, or even uh, I'll bring you to like a cooking example. Once my, uh, in, in high school, I think, or middle school, my sister decided to cook dinner one night, right? And I know she did an amazing job cooking it, but I didn't like the kind of food that she was making, right? I knew it was, I knew she did an amazing job, I just didn't like it, right? Um, and that's that's the thing, you know, you can do an amazing job, you can be a good artist, um, but not everyone has to like your art, you know? So, some people will like it, some people won't. Um, So we, uh, with that said, it's, it's, uh, it's unavoidable. And the willingness to be misunderstood and disliked is necessary in the journey of the artist. So I, I recently, well, maybe not recently, like a few months ago, I'd say, probably actually in like late spring of 2021, um, I watched a movie on Netflix about Vincent Van Gogh and his life. Um, kind of his life in his later years when he started be being an artist. Um, it was called At Eternity's Gate. This movie did an amazing job at portraying the pain and suffering that an artist, that an amazing artist like Vincent Van Gogh, must be willing to endure in order to be an artist. Uh, the movie shows that almost no one thought Van Gogh was a good artist and barely any of his paintings sold while he was alive, or at least not for much money at all. Regardless, Van Gogh continued to paint despite what anyone said. That is, despite countless people telling him he was a terrible artist and that no one would buy or enjoy his art, he just kept painting. As you know, Van Gogh is now one of the most famous artists who's ever lived. Or like more specifically, one of the most famous painters who's ever lived. And his art, um, it's loved and praised by billions around the world. It is amazing. Um, it was simply not considered beautiful in his time period, right? Sure, some people liked it, but a very small number of people liked his art, right? But over time, moods and attitudes changed about art and what is accepted and what is liked and what is seen as beautiful, and more people started to find his art beautiful over time. So in this, uh, in this regard, uh, he was born posthumously, which um, I guess maybe that's, that's kind of jargon. Um, he, he was, uh, he became known and famous after his death. And this same thing happened to the philosopher Frederick Nietzsche. Um, he was born posthumously as well. It took many years after his death before his works were enjoyed, understood, and revered by lots of people, right? Um, he experienced overwhelming hatred and disdain for what he wrote, yet he continued to write. To be an artist, a good artist at least, means that one must not only be willing to continue one's artwork, but they must be indubitably passionate about the art that they do. And that's despite all those who don't like their art, right? Now keep in mind that I'm not telling you to ignore the advice or critiques of other people. This would just be completely insane <laughs> and not wise at all. Um, but what I am telling you to do is to not let the advice or critiques of others cause you to change your style or kill your passion, right? Take these things objectively, right? Um, be less concerned with making friends and more concerned with making art, right? Don't try to please people with your art. 
Um, do it because you love it, right? Um, so this brings us to the title of the episode, Make Art, Not Friends, and Analysis. So Make Art, Not Friends is a song by Sir Little Simpson in his album Sound and Fury from 2019. It is, for the most part, about what the title suggests, making art and not friends. Though it digs into the existential crisis of the artist in that they are almost doomed to not have friends, and they almost prefer it that way. After all, the profound spirit, I'll call it, whose thoughts travel deep down into the darkest holds and travel far beyond the brightest stars, cannot have that many friends. Um, these free spirits, they wear disguises and masks to hide that wondrous, fiery passion of personal asceticism that lies within. Indeed, what use is it to speak if no one, if, if no one can understand you, right? If you're incommunicable. One feels that their thoughts and visions are beyond even themselves. Because when you're really passionate about something, when you love doing something to death, um, there's often like nothing that matters more than that thing, right? It's, it's like above you. It's above you. Um, and it's really, it's incredibly hard to explain a passion for something to someone else that doesn't really understand it, right? If you try to explain why you love writing to someone, you know, they, or who doesn't write or doesn't like writing, they might not understand you, right? Or if you think something is true, and you tell someone that you think it's true, you know, they might not, they might not understand. And for one, they, uh, you might even agree, but you're just not speaking the same language. I mean, you, I mean, you might be speaking the same language, but you just might not be understanding each other, right? Uh, this is kind of an argument that is brought up in Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling, um, which is about the biblical sacrifice of Isaac at the hands of Abraham. Um, Abraham essentially lies to Isaac about why he is sacrificing him, or like why he is bringing him to the hill to sacrifice him, or like that he is even going to sacrifice him, right? Um, and he does this because he knows that he just wouldn't understand, right? Um, that when your motives kind of come from something that is kind of feels to be beyond even yourself. Um, it's, it's really hard to understand why you're motivated by this thing or like why it makes sense or why it feels to be true to you. Um, and with that said, uh, artists that are misunderstood that are say disliked or their works are disliked. Um, they suffer a lot of loneliness and a lot of depression because I mean, like, they won't stop doing their art because they love it so much. Like, regardless of, of people not understanding them or regardless of people disliking what they do, um, they, they keep going because uh, their, their art feels to be above them. It feels to be something beyond them, right? It feels to be something that they're just so extremely passionate about that they can't stop. Um, the, these artists, these lonely, lonely artists, they must suffer or they, they will, at least, are doomed to suffer great disliking and misunderstanding. Um, if, if they are, to fuel, burn, and exhaust the fire of passion that lies within them. And with that said, uh, the, the tragedy and the dilemma of the artist, it's, it's, to be, it's to be lonely from time to time, right? It's to, uh, it's to experience these bouts of loneliness or to, to feel misunderstood or feel like feel kind of worthless at times because because they're going to keep doing themselves, right? And they're not going to give up. Um, anyways, without a further ado, here's my analysis on Sturgill Simpson's Make Art, Not Friends. First, I'm going to read through just the whole lyrics, um, just because might as well. I would recommend either listening to the song beforehand and kind of getting a, like kind of working out your own thoughts on everything before you hear mine. 
just because I don't want to kind of push into your head that like what I'm saying is correct um, or that what I'm saying is the only way to think about this, right? Um, I would listen to it first and then kind of make your own your own analysis on it and then and then come back to the episode and get going. But but anyways, uh, let's let's get right into it. Looking out the window at a world on fire. Flames see the end is near. Seen all the sights, tired of the lights. So you can let me off right here. This town's getting crowded, truth's been shrouded. Think it's time to change up the sound. Yeah, the wheels keep turning. The flames get higher. Another cycle rolls around. Face in the mirrors, all skin and bone. Bloodshot eyes and a heart of stone. Never again, I'd rather be alone. Think I'm just, I'm gonna just stay home and make art, not friends. I love saying no to all the yes men just to see the look on their face. I love how everybody knows what's best, but nobody knows their place. Sucker every second, stack them up to the sky. For every winner, there's a hundred that die. So you get yours, stay out of mine. Here's to the memories, where do I sign? Face in the mirrors, all skin and bone, bloodshot eyes and a heart of stone. Never again, I'd rather be alone. Think I'm gonna just stay home and make art, not friends. Oh, it's getting hard to find a good friend, so close the door behind you, falling when more come in. Nobody writes, nobody calls, nobody bother, cause I'm over it all. Face in the mirrors, all skin and bone, bloodshot eyes and a heart of stone. Never again, I'd rather be alone, think I'm gonna just stay home and make art, not friends. I will now go stanza by stanza, and I'll describe, at least in my point of view, the meaning of the lyrics. Okay. Looking out the window at a world on fire, flames see the end is near. Seeing all the sights, tired of the lights, so you can let me off right here. So I think uh, the artist, Sturgill Simpson, he feels that the world is desolate and empty. It is almost apocalyptic. At least that's how it's being portrayed, right? Um, he has everything he needed to see, or at least he, he has seen everything that he needs to see, right? And wants to end his journey in the outside world. The outside world, in this light, at least the way that he portrays it, it lacks much beauty or meaning to him. Um, the world's on fire. The end is near. It is, it is almost worthless. It is dead. It's nothing more than a world on fire, and he's seen enough of it. Um, so, let me off right here, right? And we've got this town's getting crowded, truth's been shrouded, think it's time to change up the sound. Okay. So the artist, he's mentioning almost like an increase in population, the, the town's getting crowded. Um, th this could be also, um, as a sideline, this could be his fans are increasing, right? He's getting more fans. Um, but But either way, He's getting more fans, or there's an increase in population, something like that. And an increase in the numbers of the herd, right? Of the herd that follows Sturgill, or the herd that just lives in his town, right? Now, as mentioned earlier, Young thought that an increase in population leads to the increasing devaluation of the individual, right? I mean, uh, and we also went over this in the, the Ted Kaczynski episode, right? Uh, the, the bigger that society becomes, the less freedom the individual has, right? Um, and then there's uh, the, the truth's been shrouded, in quotes. The, the artist is misunderstood, right? Uh, a Sturgill is being misunderstood. The truth's been shrouded. One is bound to be more misunderstood with the increase of people. Um, that's what Young said, right? Um, I think it's... Time to change up the sound. 
Here, this could mean a lot of things. For one, he could be relating that his criticism is causing him to want to change up his sound, maybe. Um, or two, he doesn't like that so many people understand him. As this means his music is almost not personal enough. It's uh, <laughs> um, he he wants to change up his sound to reduce the number of his crowd. Or maybe three, he simply wants to try something new. He's a free spirit, right? Um, he's trying to go with his gut. And then we have, yeah, the wheels keep turning, the flames get higher, another cycle rolls around. So the artist keeps going on with his life, his daily schedule, and all the while he feels that the flames are getting higher and something quite destructive is approaching. Um the uh the listener we can we can kind of sense that he has this desire to escape from this this daily ritual um he, he wants to escape kind of being caught in this limbo um feeling right uh the the wheels just keep keep whirling and the, the tension's building right so now here comes the chorus face in the mirrors all skin and bone bloodshot eyes and a heart of stone never again i'd rather be alone Think I'm gonna just stay home and make art, not friends. So, the artist is starting to realize that all this time trying to please everyone, letting his wheels keep turning, is destroying him. His heart feels like stone, and he's exhausted. Then, never again. I'd rather be alone. He's exhausted and beaten down by other people. The art and passion is being beaten out of him, and he feels weak and miserable. Think I'm gonna just stay home and make art not friends. He is not meant to appease the masses. He's healthiest and happiest at home, alone, making art and not friends. Bold. I love saying no to all the yes men, just to see the look on their face. I love how everybody knows what's best, but nobody knows their place. I I think I said bold before I started saying it. I I wrote all the lyrics in bold, so yeah, just just ignore that. Um, but anyways, the, the artist is asserting himself in the world and doing what he wants, not what everyone else wants. He says no to the yes men who seek to tell him that they know what's best for the artist, yet they have no idea what in the hell they're doing with themselves. The artist is not playing their game. He's playing his. He's not concerned with being us pleasing others, but rather he's concerned with his own passion and his own art. And if you are concerned with controlling others, you likely don't know your own place in the world. I think that's what he's trying to say. Sucker every second, sack him up to the sky. For every winner, there's a hundred that die. So you get yours, stay on mine. Here's some memories. Where do I sign? So there's fools everywhere. They don't realize that, quote, for every winner, there's a hundred that die. That said, the artist must recognize that he may very well lose. He may not be liked. He may not become some famous singer or artist or writer, right? He might lose. Um, to that regard, his art must not be done for the goal of winning the attention of others, but rather out of the love of doing the art itself. So you get yours, stay out of mine. The artist is saying that it is up to the individual to make himself happy and fulfilled and to not rely on others for that. People want to use the artist for his success, but the artist won't let them. And as for here's to the memories, what are a sign? I would say this is likely a cautionary tale of the artist saying that one might sign their art away for their art or their life, right? Away for the sake of the pleasurable experience of fame. Um, or maybe he is signing an autograph. I cannot be so sure. Uh, I'd leave a comment on YouTube or I'll, I'll probably post like a Spotify question. And then if you have any thoughts on this lyric, just, uh, just send them in. Okay, so we, we come back to the chorus next with uh, the face in the mirror, all skin and bone, etc. Um, I'm just going to move on to the next stanza. And then I'm going to go back to that chorus in the end. Oh, it's hard. Oh, it's getting hard to find a good friend. So close the door behind you, falling when more come in. Nobody writes, nobody calls, nobody bother, come over at all. So the artist find, finds it 
getting hard to find a good friend. For the not well-known artists, this could be attributed to their feelings of being misunderstood and their art disliked. But for the context of this song, it could also be attributed to everyone trying to use Sturgill for gaining their own success, right? Either way, uh, Sturgill feels lonely and is difficult to connect with anyone. He goes into solitude. And still, no one writes or calls, but again, he doesn't care because he's over it all, right? So the, the chorus, which I will read again, um, puts a nice bow on this. Face in the mirror is all skin and bone, bloodshot eyes and a heart of stone. Never again, I'd rather be alone. Think I'm going to just stay home and make art, not friends. He'd rather be alone making art than dealing with all those people who don't understand him, care about him, or even want to understand or care about him. These people, they like, they kind of deter him, right? They, uh, they subtract from his artistic experience, right? Because they're all trying to get, get at him, right? Or they're trying to critique him, or they're trying to tell him that he's not good enough and stuff like that, right? Um, and, and he's not in it for the fame or the money, right? And especially when we're talking about the music industry, especially today, these days, um, a, a lot of these artists are really being kind of abused by companies like Spotify, the one that I'm using for this podcast, right? Or, uh, or record companies that basically alienate the artist from their own work, right? Um, he... He's not, he doesn't want to deal with all that right now, right? He, he wants to just stay home and make art and not quote-unquote friends. Um, and, and often when he is around some people, um, these quote-unquote friends, he feels more lonely than when he is at home making art and not friends. His artwork actually gives him a sense of companionship, love, and happiness. His art is a true friend of his. Because it's, it's a mirror of himself. All art really is, is a mirror of ourselves. A mirror into what our own subconscious mind finds beautiful or worth examination. And this, especially in relation to Jung and his psychology, is a manifestation of what we find beautiful and worthy of examination within ourselves. Now I'm not saying that the artists must be lonely in order to produce good art or that they can't have any friends. But what I am saying is that the good artist's art may not be understood or liked by everyone, since art is in and of itself a reflection of one's own beliefs, desires, personality, etc. It is apparent that the self may then not be fully understood or liked by everyone. But nonetheless, at least in my view, true friendship, the kind of friendship that keeps you awake for hours talking to each other, that provokes a feeling of awe, wonder, and reverence, beauty towards each other, and instills within these two friends nothing but passion and love for one another is a work of art in and of itself. And with that said, let that beautiful art from within your soul pour out upon the world. Don't let this fire be contained. Shine on, you crazy diamonds, right? Make art, not friends. Thank you for listening.